Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Sproles, and I'm the president of the New York School of Interior Design, and I am pleased to be able to welcome you to the first lecture in our spring public program series, titled Behind the Scene Set Decoration in TV and Film. And I have to say, uh, we are extremely excited to be having this topic tonight. Every few months, the uh, public programming committee gets together, and we decide what's going to be coming up. And I can say this topic has been on our list for two, three years, but we've just never been able to get it on the calendar. So I am very excited that we're finally able to do this tonight. We even teach a class in this topic. So I'm also pleased to see a lot of students here as well. Anyway, uh, the discussion tonight will be led by Andrew Jackness, a production designer who has worked in film, television, plays, and musicals, and even opera. His credits are too lengthy to list here, but he most recently designed season one of The Blacklist for NBC, and he was nominated for an Emmy for his work on The Masters of Sex on Showtime. He has designed the feature films The Big Wedding, Everybody's Fine, Kill Shot, Big Night, and The Imposters, just to name a few. And Andrew is joined by three prominent set decorators. Tonight we have George DeTita, Regina Graves, and David Schlesinger. Briefly, uh, George uh, has worked with Francis Coppola, Steven Spielberg, Sidney Pollack, uh, Penny Marshall, and he most recently worked on the movie Birdman, which is nominated for an Academy Award for Best Picture this year. Regina Graves, who we are proud to say attended the New York School of Interior Design, uh, has worked on movies including Willy, Woody Allen's Blue Jasmine, Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds, and Oliver Stone's World Trade Center. She was most recently the set decorator for the Knicks on Cinemax. And lastly, David just designed the sets for the movie Annie. He has also worked on The Immigrant, The Twilight Saga, The Big Wedding, and many, many more. So you all came to hear them, not me. So I'm going to pass the podium over to you. Good evening, all. Um, thank you so much for coming, and thank you guys here for having us. This is um, one of the unsung um, fields that uh, that exist in in movie making, and um, and I'm so pleased to be here in the same room with three decorators. Um, you don't usually find that unless you're at a Christmas party. So. Um, uh, you know, making movies um, is storytelling, and um, we are um, we are storytellers. We're not natural speakers, but um, but what we do is take scripts and interpret them. The director is the cook for the whole stew, and and we are the sous chefs that actually put it together. The um, the role of the production designer is to interpret a script with a director and a cinematographer and to decide how you're going to approach it, how, how we're going to um, interpret the entire thing. And then with, uh, for a production designer, with a set decorator and an art director um, as each hand, you actually execute these ideas. The decorator um, does not necessarily function independently, but they are independent entities who are um, absolutely invaluable to the process. And they're part of my creative process and every production designer's creative process. The, um, uh, when you read a script, um, although they're, they're called set decorators, you may not realize that um, every location is a set. So, um, so from an artillery field to an Upper East Side drawing room, a set decorator is responsible for all of the elements that actually go into that. And, um, and we come up with uh, the widest variety of kind of topics. I mean, we could be doing bomb making basements or we could be doing um, parking lots. Um, it's, um, there are skills have to be vast, and they work with a team um, that do everything from tiling, carpeting, um, to plumbing and electrical wiring. Um, every set is is part of how you tell a story. So, um, so in selecting a decorator, you you look for the skills that um, each decorator has, 
and, um, and, and try and find the best person for that job and the kind of person mm -hmm. that you want to work with. And um, they're some of my best friends and, um, and definitely the best support system I could have. So um, what I'm going to do is, um, is show a little bit of a film that I put together um, with some samples of set decoration and, um, and uh, show you what, what things look like in period. And, um, and just with the idea um, in mind that when we do this, um, we usually find a location. The location is emptied. The location is then painted and, um, or, or signs added, whatever. And then the decorator comes in and does their magic. And their magic comes from a variety of sources. It, um, it could be from hardware supplies to, um, to uh, different kinds of glass, to wallpapers, carpets, um, lamps, furniture. And, um, and the sources that they work from are you know, prop houses, and, um, and different internet shopping sources. It's, it's a very, very broad field. And, um, and in the end, when you get the final product on film, their work is really what shows. And so, um, so I click the mouse. Um, While they're doing that, um, I'll add that um, that you know putting a film together is is a big collaborative effort, and uh, every set is usually uh, discussed ad infinitum by the number of people that need to um, that need to be involved, and that can be um, you know from scheduling with the first assistant director to the special effects people. Um, uh, the cinematographer and the gaffer who lights it, um, uh, all, of, all of us work together as a unit, and, um, and that's how movies are made. The, um, <laughs> it's funny, I passed two shooting crews on the way here from Fifth Avenue, and, um, and you can see them all over New York. We work uh, on location out of trucks, um, but we also work in studio, and, um, and when we're working in studio, the sets are designed um, and built and structured, and there's a whole series of people that put them together. And, um, and we all have to communicate with one another to make it happen. And um, I'll just tell one, one little story that um, uh, one of my first jobs in New York was um, working as a scenic artist, uh, which is a painter, um, on Prince of the City. It was right out of school. And I saw this guy coming in with um, all this stuff after we'd painted these rooms and plastered them. And it was in the old customs house down, which is now the Museum of the American Indian. And this guy kept coming in with, with people. And they were filing cabinets and blinds and furniture and everything. And I finally said, so who is that guy? I, I'd only done theater. And they said, oh, that's the set decorator. It was George's father. And, um, uh, and uh, that was my introduction to set decorating. And, and then as a scenic artist, we had to go in and dust the blinds down and age everything. And did the sound just 
change here. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, we're going to try this again now. Um, this is part of a film that I've made on production. Um, so that's that portion of the film. Um, and um, I, I just like to uh, point out a couple of things. Um, one is that um, it, when you have something like um, an explosion or a house that has to age 30 years or, um, you know, something like that, um, the company has to go away and the decoration department has to come in and do it. The painters come in, the decorators come in, and everything has to be redone. And I, I'd also like to pr point out one other thing, um, which is um, uh, because as I, I was watching um, Remain to the Day, um, the difference between a prop and what's decoration. And um, a prop is pretty much anything an actor touches um, or that's mentioned in the script. Um, it can be vehicles and things like that. But the look is actually governed by the decorator because prop people just don't tend to be visual. They, they get the stuff. So when you have a, a dinner service, um, although the people are eating off of the plates, it's the decorator that gets it. And um, so, uh, um, so with that said, uh, I'd like to introduce um, these wonderful guys, uh, George DeTita, Regina Graves, and David Schlesinger, and, um, and ask them to take the stage. Hello, I'm David um, Schlesinger. I really want to thank these guys first, Andy, Regina, and George. Thank you for participating and being part of this, and uh, just thanks for being wonderful for our uh, industry. I'm going to flip through a few of my sets and talk a little bit about them and talk about what a decorator does. Um, you know, we create visual cues that tell stories. We use furniture, we use fabric, we use text texture to tell the stories and tell who our characters are. Um, this is a set, uh, the next few sets are from a movie I did called The Immigrant, which unfortunately didn't have a very wide release. but. Uh, it's a really beautiful movie, and I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, took place in 1920s New York. Uh, this is a set we built on stage. Uh, it was a, a tenement apartment, but the character is a bit of an impresario. He's, a, he's a, basically a pimp. And uh, so he's, he's, he entertains a lot, and he's kind of putting on this, this, this false environment. So it's a little nicer than your typical tenement. Um, and that's... that's uh, that's how I feel at the end of a hard day decorating. It's, it's, we, you know, a typical movie can have 40, 50, 60 sets, and some of them don't need a lot of attention. Some of them are built. This is built. Some of them need everything. Um, so it's, in, our job is to help the designer figure out what it looks like and make it happen and get all this stuff, find all these things, and then assemble it and make it look like whatever it's supposed to be. Um, this is that same apartment. Same, same place. Uh, this is a backstage dressing room, part of the same movie. Um, so in doing this set, I, would do, I did a lot of research, you know, what would be in a dressing room and what, you know, and then figure out what's appropriate for our character and, and the type of, we're, you know, not, we're a, a Lower East Side, not very nice, uh, you know, burlesque kind of theater. So what, what's appropriate for that? Um, some, some detail. I try, you know, detail is a big part of what we do. We're creating these worlds, so we want to put, you know, as much life into it as we can. And uh, so these things were shopped. I mean, that's a big part of what we do. We, we get the stuff. I mean, everything there was, was found and was a choice and was thought about and then, you know, gathered, bought, transported, and then put in place. So, so we, not only are we dealing with you know, the design and the look, there's an incredible amount of logistics that go into what we do. Um, uh, this is from a movie called The Big Wedding, which I actually did with Andy. Uh, this is a, Robert De Niro is a, a sculptor and this was his, his studio. And um, so one of the things I love about being a set decorator is I learn something new about every, every job. And this, job I learned how a, a, sculptor, a sculptor would work and you know, I went to a lot of different studios and um, in the end we, I, I made a deal with two or three different artists and we rented a lot of their equipment and uh, so that's, that's where these things came from and then we 
put it together to make it look like you know, what it's supposed to look like. Um, this is from Twilight. This was a set that was built on stage. This is the, the honeymoon <coughs> cottage for uh, Bella and Edward. And uh, this, this was a job, you know, as crazy as it was, we shot this in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Most of that movie was shot there for financial reasons. And so even though the movie takes place, you know, doesn't take in the Northwest, it, we, it was mostly shot on a sound stage in, in Louisiana. Uh, again, everything here, you know, at the decorator sources and figures that figures it out and gets it and puts it in place. Uh, more from Twilight. This is our our Brazilian honeymoon uh, house at Esme, um, and things come from all all different sources. Those those chairs were our antique Brazilian chairs. The bed we had fabricated. The the rug is from Pier One, so it's. <laughs> You know, which was, I, was, I surprised myself by getting it, but it, you know, it worked. It was the right thing. Um, more from Twilight. This is the, the Cullen Library. And, uh, and so I was talking to Andy earlier today, and our, our moderator, and he asked me if there was anything I had put on a set that, that I was embarrassed by and, and that I regretted. And uh, there, there was, and that's why I have these images. Those, those scissors have haunted me. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was a good idea, but uh, in, in this case, you know, Al, this is Alice's bedroom from the movie and uh, Twilight, and we we had this idea that she was very crafty. She made she made uh, Bella's dress, and so there was a lot of craft crafty craft items in her room, and and I thought the big scissors were great when I found them. I actually went to a lot of trouble to find them, and then I saw the movie, and I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> um, Decorators also get, get art, and that's, that's a big part of what I did on, on this movie. Um, I, I tried to find a lot of art that related to, the, I had this idea that the, you know, the vampires are obsessed with, with the body and flesh and decay and death because and, they don't die. And so we had, I used a lot of art that related to that, and that's what those, those figures are, which I was actually very happy about. The scissors I could live without. But, um, and there's some more art from that movie. And I think that's it. So I have the best job there is. I love what I do. I learn something new every day. I work with amazing, amazingly talented people. I'm always amazed when we do a set and I look at them like, how do we ever do that? And uh, somehow it all happens. So I'm going to turn it over to Regina, who's going to flip through some of her stuff. You might have to bear with me because I don't know if I can speak and hold the microphone and click this at the same time. Uh, anyway, I'm Regina Graves. I attended this school many, many years ago. Um, I basically, I think, fell into my um, occupation now kind of by mistake after I finished school. I was trying to get a job as, a, as an assistant, as an interior, in a dec, you know, interior decorating firm, and then answered an ad in the newspaper for someone that loves movies, uh, knows period furniture, has sales experience. Um, and it was an ad for a prop house in, uh, in the city, which is a big prop house here called Eclectic Encore. Um, and I started working there. I loved it. I met a lot of talented set decorators, uh, art directors, Production designers would even come in, and I said, this is, you know, it has to do with interior design. I love film, and I'm just going to kind of see where it goes and take it from here. So um, these are a couple of things that I decorated recently. This is one of our sets from uh, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. This set was built uh, on a stage, the biggest stage at Kaufman Studios. And um, the whole, I don't know if anyone saw the movie, but the whole point of the movie was uh, Ben Stiller was an archivist, a photo archival person at Time Life. Uh, you know, with the new wave of computers coming in, that whole phase of that department was just getting phased out and, you know, computers were coming in. So we tried to have an older feeling towards things. We built a lot of this furniture custom. Um, we used like a cool blue palette because that's just the way the production designers saw it and the way they wanted to shoot it all. Um, and we tried to do everything in, in an analog world, so you don't see many computers, you don't see a lot of electronics and stuff like that in here. But I'll flip through a couple of different things. We had all of our, our um, desks custom built. 
uh, by our construction department. So what happens then, a lot of the times, the art department will draw something up specifically, and then we will be responsible to get all the hardware and pieces that go onto that desk, and then we obviously dress the desks. Here are a couple more uh, pictures from that same, that was all Walter Mitty. This is Blue Jasmine. Um, the reason why I put this there on this uh, reel was to show you that um, we were looking for the perfect tablecloth. It was a very long table. I should have found a, a better picture of it. Um, but sometimes we have to be really resourceful. So we couldn't find the perfect color, you know, something that popped. So the production designer and I, who was Santa Laquasto, were down an ABC carpet. We found two five by seven carpets that would work perfectly. We had them sewn together, and there's our tablecloth. Oh, back to Walter Mitty. This was another, this was a table that we had custom made, our, our conference table for Walter Mitty, which I thought came out beautifully. More set dressing. Um, so as David said, a lot of the times we're responsible for the art. So this was kind of a collaboration between um, the set decorating department, the art department, and the graphics department. So we basically had to do a lot of research for time, you know, actual life uh, covers. And then the director and the production designer chose them. We had to send them over to the graphics department, which had them blown up, and then our set dressers framed them out and mounted them onto the wall. Um, more time life. More shots. And believe it or not, that floor, it looks like it's a terrazzo floor, but it's actually uh, paper that the scenics printed, put down, and then uh, put like a glossy finish over it. So we, um, we do pretty amazing things on film, I think. But other things that set decorators do that a lot of people don't know about, it's not only the pretty things. Like I said before, we get a lot of the hardware. So we're responsible for these elevators were all, all made. So we're responsible for the elevator parts, the elevator up-down buttons. Um, there's uh, recessed lighting up in the ceiling. We have to get all of that. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work to do. And basically, with a set like this, it was a huge set, and we had maybe four weeks to put it all together. That was from floor to ceiling to building and to dressing it. Um, this was a set that I did for the movie Nonstop. Um, and I'm showing this because not only, again, do we do pretty things in wallpaper, but this was the cockpit, and um, I was responsible for getting all the little but buttons, gadgets, handles, airplane seats. We had to reupholster those. And, you know, so you do a lot of research. It's not like, I, I, you know, we just go out and decorate. You know, you have to look at a lot of photos, find out where these things are made, um, sometimes improvise and use things that look like they could work. But this is the final product. Um, this was a set that I did for Gotham for the pilot. This was uh, Poison Ivy's apartment when she was a little girl. Again, it's not a beautiful set, but it was fun to do. And you have to gather all these you know, little things to make it look like the perfect down apartment. This was another set for Gotham. This was uh, Wayne Manor. Uh, this was built into a location. Um, I think it was in Staten Island. But anyway, it was basically, right now it's a boys' naval, naval academy school. And this was the uh, a cafeteria. So we emptied out the cafeteria. Like I said, we have a matter of like three days to empty it out, and then this is what we ended up with. Ah, the paintings. So Andy's asking me to talk about the paintings. So a lot of these paintings that were in here were chosen, like David said, everything is chosen for a reason. So uh, Doug Craner, who was the production designer, myself, Danny Cannon, who was the director, and um, the writer had a talk because there was a very specific way they wanted this set to look. He wanted to look very noble. He wanted to look, uh, you know, he wanted to have like some fighting scenes. So we have a, um, a standing suit of armor in there. I'm not sure how I go back. So there's a large painting, like a kind of gladiator fight, but all of the, all of the paintings were chosen with you know, a special thought in mind. And most of these paintings I did rent from a rental house here because they have to be cleared. This is more Gotham. This is a, a design pres uh, presentation that was presented to the um, Art Directors Guild to see if we could be recognized for an award, which 
uh, we were nominated. Unfortunately, did not win, but I'm very proud that we were nominated anyway. Um, this precinct was, is like, I'm not sure if anyone watches this show, but it's a three-story precinct. A lot of work went into it. Um, I found the old church lights at Old Good Things. We have a mixture of, of like 60s, 70s, and 80s furniture because there, there really isn't a time period that is designated for this because it's a fantasy show. But we are responsible to get the light fixtures, the fluorescent fixtures, the desks, the file cabinets, the paperwork that goes on, you know, on the file, on the tables, the flooring, um, and you know, and I'm saying this, we get everything, but. I physically do not put it on the set. We have a big team. We have, uh, you know, set dressers and a lead man that I couldn't do what I do without those people, and I couldn't do what I do without my assistants. And you know, so it's it's not just me. This is the penthouse apartment at Gotham. Um, we went for a very modern look here. Again, although it's modern look, but I should say with a with a ode to like the 30s glam. But this was a very fun set to do. It was, it was also built on on stage. And again, the artwork was picked, you know, for, for the person because she was supposed to be an art uh, collector. These are just street scenes that we did, that we do. This is the Nick. I thought this was going to be shown later. Is it? Uh, it can is. I click could, through? Yeah, this I'm going to click through because we're going to talk part. about this later. But this is the show that I'm currently on, uh, season two, and I'm really happy to be on it. Uh, but it takes place in 1900, and it's a lot of fun, and I'm going to talk to you about it, I think, in a little yeah, while. part two coming up. In part two. <laughs> so you get a preview. Part two. Okay, I'm not good with this clicker. It's a little slow. More than Nick. Okay. And now I'm going to hand it over to George. <laughs> this? I don't have to. No, I think you just talked. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, let me just give you a, a little uh, uh, history about, you know, how I started. Um, I was an art school major. I was a printmaker back in the 70s and probably had ideas about doing advertising art or whatever. My dad um, was in the industry. My grandfather was in the industry. Um, my grandfather dates back to the golden age of Hollywood started probably in about 1920. Um, he was an electrician, became a sound man, talked a lot when I was growing up about uh, the talkies and worked with D.W. Griffith, worked on coconuts. Um, you know, all the people that, uh, all the famous uh, stars of, of, of the era. And uh, there was also a, sec a segment of the, f of the family who also worked in newsreel and there were famous stories about people who in the family who were there when the Hindenburg went down and, and various uh, news events over uh, you know, our, their lifetime. Uh, my dad um, started working in the 50s and uh, was a set decorator. And so when I graduated college in the mid 70s and didn't have a job to go to, I started working in the industry. And probably around 1979 or so, he got an offer in 1980 to do the film Ragtime, uh, Milos Foreman directing, and he very much wanted to do it, uh, but I think he was probably on Prince of the City, <laughs> um, and he couldn't start the prep early enough, so um, he said to me, I really want to do this film, it really sounds great, and um, you know, I want to do it. So the only way I can really do it is if I get somebody to kind of work with me and start it. And he asked me if I, I'd be interested. And I told him I would. I mean, you know, it was a, a great project, an interesting period, and um, something that, uh, you know, I found that I could really kind of sink my teeth into. I think I was 24 when I did it. Um, anyway, I took it on. I probably um, was there for four months before he came on board. And um, I basically got all of the in-town locations, all the New York City locations, because the show was done in the city and it was done out of town, it was done upstate, it was done down at the Jersey Shore and whatever. But one of my big sets became, um, we took over a two to three block area on the Lower East Side, 11th Street from I think Avenue A down to C. Basically had to turn back the clock to 1906. And um, you know, it was, like I said, I think it was 1980. 
Um, the architecture was there, but all the other work remained to be done. Back then, the research and everything else is a lot different than it is today. You can just turn on the computer, and if you want something, you know, you Google it, and it comes up. Back then, it was a lot of phone calls, and one, one call led to another. You talk to somebody, oh, yeah, I have that, I think I have that, and then you wait for the Polaroids to arrive. And when they come, and you look through them and say, hey, this is what I'm looking for, and then that leads to something else. And, and that's how all of that, you know, our, our, our hunt in terms of decoration went. And, um, Basically, that whole street, I had shop fronts, I had um, wagons, um, you know, it was, a, it was a market street, so we had a lot to do and, and a lot to gather. And at the time, you know, I probably had, I don't know, I think I probably had a four-month jump before they started filming, which I think was in the summertime. So that was kind of my introduction into my, the first uh, film that I, that I worked on. Um, and uh, it led to uh, the career that I have today, and I think I've been, I think this is about my 37th or 38th year, and um, anyway, so the, that leads to the film that is currently in theaters, Birdman, um, which is, uh, all takes place in the New York theater. It was uh, a film that was conceived to be um, basically all backstage and whatever, and when I came on board, Kevin Thompson was a designer and explained to me basically what they wanted to do. and. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's, it's, it's about everything about the theater, about somebody who, who uh, decides to, uh, a washed up actor who was at one time a, uh, a big Hollywood star and now his, his career is on the, uh, you know, on the downside. And he decides to mount a play and of course everything goes wrong. Um, and the idea that the director had in mind was that this was going to be a, um, a film where you couldn't see any of the cuts. It was a one continuous move. And uh, it's pretty brilliant the way it's all put together. It's pretty seamless. And when you look at it, when I looked at it, and I worked on it, I thought to myself, how did we do all that? Um, so uh, I got a few pictures I'll show to you. Um, basically, we created the entire backstage of, of, of the theater. And then we shot at the St. James Theater on 44th Street for the theater itself and the wings and the stage. But everything that you saw backstage was all built on a soundstage in Astoria. Let's see here. Here we go. Um, anyway, various. Um, the set was basically kind of constructed as a um, probably like a rectangle. Um, it had different levels of uh, stairs leading up to um, uh, the different uh, rooms and whatever. We probably had, I think, uh, four dressing rooms. We had a, um, a wardrobe room, which was actually I think my favorite part of it because we really got to um, get into incredible detail. This was a set you could turn that camera around 360 degrees and even look up because I even stacked fabric up top and whatever just so that you you really um, could move seamlessly throughout the whole thing. This was Riggins uh, um, dressing room. Um, one of the shots that I really, when I saw the film, I was amazed at was when the camera started outside and floated right through that window and into the stage set and I thought, wow, pretty great the way they did that. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was quite, uh, quite a great uh, shot. Anyway, you can see the detail in here. Um, we talked about, um, you know, what we wanted to see in here. The script dictated um, kind of his character in a way, um, lots of times. You know, so the script gives you a, a little bit of an idea of, of, of that, that persona you're trying to create, and other times you're creating it because you don't get enough information. I work with directors who will tell me um, a lot about the character and won't give me as much information. So um, lots of times, you know, it's up to you to kind of create that backstory and, and, and give the viewer what you want because, you know, basically it's all about the script and what, you know, you see and what we're trying to tell the audience. Um, you know, we got into a lot of detail. I mean, before we started, Kevin and I talked about the color palette and, and the approach to, the, you know, how we wanted these rooms to look. I did a lot of research and we saw a number of, of actual Broadway theaters when the shows were going on, so I got to see backstage about, you know, how everybody kind of lives and what their environments look like. and. Um, you know, basically, you know, they kind of live back there and, and, you know, part of their lives take place back there. So all of it right down to the notices and the, and the cards that they get on opening night um, were replicated and, 
and that kind of thing. I did have uh, probably, I think, three people working with me because I had very little time to put this together. I think we had about five and a half to six weeks before, from the time we started to the time it had to be ready. They shot the stage um, first before, this is, let's go back there. Um, they, they shot the stage work first and then they moved to the St. James. So everything that was done on stage was, was done up front. And, um, you know, it came together, I think, uh, all pretty good considering uh, a little bit of time that we had and um, you know it was a set that we put a lot of detail into um, and I think uh, because of the way it was shot that camera is constantly in your face and I think that it, it shows on film anyway um, I'll come back and I'll talk about uh, the TV show that I'm working on next in the next part anyway thank you about taking a stage? No, I'll jump up and start okay. talking about it. Okay. Oops, here we go. So, this, I'm back. In this second part, we're going to talk a little bit about the process of some specific sets that I've worked on, and these guys are going to do the same. So, everything we do starts with the script. And uh, I'm going to talk about Stax's apartment in the movie Annie, which uh, is, is out now. Um, that's it. That's all we get. We get a little description. Uh, the door is open. Annie and Mrs. Govet, Govetschek, whatever her name is, are, are stunned. We reverse to see why. It's amazing. Whenever a decorator sees that in a script, they get worried. It means a lot of work's ahead of us. A full floor penthouse with wall-to-wall -wall ceiling windows. I'm like, God, that's a lot of window treatments. State-of-the-art technology with incredible furniture. That, that's... That's it. That's the description. So then the designer and the, and the uh, director, you know, they put their heads together and they come up with what, you know, what this space is going to be. And they decide whether we're going to build it on stage or whether it's going to be an actual location. Um, in this case, we decided it would be an actual location uh, because it had a tie in with some things that happened outside. And they, I don't, that's what they decided. I don't get involved in locations. So this is what they gave us to work with. That's the four. Um, so that's what we walked into, and this is what we have to make into our Stax's apartment. Uh, here's another one. Um, this is one of the, this is at Four World Trade Center. Uh, this is one of the most challenging locations I've ever had to deal with. The building was not open; it didn't have its uh, CFO yet. It was under construction. We could only use the those elevators that go up the side of the building. Um, and we could only get in the elevators like two or three hours a day because the building is <laughs> under construction. Uh, so it was logistically very challenging um, to convert this into the set, which I'll show you in a second. Um, that blue outline is where we were going to put our sofa. Um, another real challenge of this, which I'll, I'll show you the finished product in a second, but about, a m we had maybe six weeks from the time we first walked in here and maybe four weeks before uh, we were supposed to start shooting. The director of photography came here at night for the first time. Um, he had only been there during the day, and at night he discovered all those windows become mirrors, and he wasn't going to be able to light it without lighting from above, so they decided, okay, we're going to put in a drop ceiling. Well, that falls into set decorating. So in that period of time, we had to come up with a very elegant uh, drop ceiling. We had to source it, install it, um, we were working 24 hours a day to get to get it ready. This is the only time I think in my career I thought maybe a set wasn't going to be ready. Uh, and that's what it turned into. That's the after. And that's what we do. We, you know, we do these amazing transformations. Um, the sofa, you know, it was, so the idea here was the set was meant to be pretty cold, uh, cold environment until Annie comes into, uh, into his life and then everything warms up. And, um, there's a whole thing, they, there's a lot of song and dance that happens in here. And, <laughs> no, literally, I mean, there's, there's a lot of choreography. A lot of the design of this set was based on the choreography, and that's the, why we have this giant uh, semi-circular sofa, which we fabricated and at a great expense. Um, some more pictures of the set. And, uh, uh, you know, in that, in that little script while there's something, that, that blurb in the, in the script, it talks about her dancing on the fountain. That thing on the right is a big fountain, you know. So, you know, we have to create that fountain. You know, the art department built the structure, but we tile it and we make it work. And 
There you go. Um, this is another uh, set from, from Annie. We needed a bodega deli set. And you know, there's a thousand, you know, hundreds of, many, many of them in New York. But they decided, they being the producers and production designer, that we would go to this burnt out building and turn it into a bodega. And <laughs> so this is what we started with. That's the inside before, and I'm not exaggerating. Um, we had a we had a core floor, so and the reason they wanted this location is it was be, it was across the street from Miss Hannigan's, and they there was action from Miss Hannigan's to this on the street. Although I, I think they could have done it another way, but anyway. So and this is what we turned it into. This is our after. Um, when we were, you know, as, as these guys can attest to, when you're doing these sets on the street, a lot of times people come in and they want to buy stuff, which is like <laughs> the ultimate compliment because that means we've done our job. Um, and it's just it's about, you know, I, I'm showing this just to show the detail, the level of detail that you know, we want to make it feel like a real place. So, any, and we want to give the space character, and we do that through, through different objects and the details. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this movie. It's not out yet. It's called True Story. Um, we all start with research. That's the first thing we do. And, and this movie, there's a big, uh, one of our big sets is the New York Times uh, bullpen area. So I, you know, we, we, we looked at, we couldn't shoot at the real New York Times, so we had to create it. And uh, this, is, this is research. This is the New York Times. Um, and we look at these things as decorators. You know, not only are we looking at the furniture, I want to know what the books are. I want to know. I want to know what it, you know. What does this journalist use in his day-to-day -day life, and you know what what makes this space unique to him? Um, these are all. This is all research. So you know, I'll, why does he have that that whatever that thing is that uh, apple bear apple basket? I, you know. So these are things we want to know as decorators because we're defining these characters by the space that we're creating for them. Um, this is our location that they that that we chose, which is at John Jay College. Um, this is before, so we went in and we you know we clear this all out. I think we maybe had a a week to do this set, which is I mean to, to actually clear it out and dress it, and I probably had a month to, to shop for it and to think about it, which is a lot. This is we had time on this this particular one, so that's before and that's our after. So. Um, so each of those spaces, each of those desks is, is an environment and you know, we, it's, all, you know, it's all about what's there and what defines and we tried to make each of these spaces unique to the type of reporter that was sitting at that desk. Um, actually, actually, Jonah Hill was in the movie, he was the reporter and that's, that's his desk. Um, and somebody else's, I don't remember who's. And that's it for me. Come on, turn it over to Christina. Well, I don't know the order. Well, there is, there's a movie from the Nick in there. So I think it's slide. Do you want me to just flip through? Or okay. You want to start with that? I don't know the time. The, the, it's the movie, the AD. Oh. Okay, so I'll, right now, David's I mean, going to play um, a little section of, of the Nick. It's a little one minute. Um, preview to our show that we also contributed to the Art Department, uh, Art Directors Guild Awards to be nominated. But it'll give you a little look into um, our life on the next. Hopefully. Yes, let's see. <laughs> uh, no, I, so you just got to wing to talk about this. I'll go back to the beginning. Whoops. Is it on here? I thought it was. I, uh, <laughs> bear with us. Technical difficulty. I put it on, but I'm just going to go back to the beginning. And That's okay. I just talked about this. Okay. Can you just flip? Is, it, is this the beginning? Uh, I might have a couple more back. It's a little lagging. There I we go. That was it. That's yeah. it. So David talked about the process of breaking down a script and how it all comes about. Um, like all the decorators, that's basically how it starts. But with the Nick, in addition to that, we have illustrators um, that go back to like what Andrew was talking about. The, the production designer sits down with an illustrator and basically comes up with what the set is going to look like. And that's, that's really the basis for our show because it takes place in 1900. Um, we use a lot of research and, you know, we want to be correct to that period. 
So Howard Cummings, our production designer, sat down with the illustrator, um, which you can see on the lower left-hand corner is the illustration that we came up with. That's what we wanted our set to look like that we built our surgical uh, theater because back then, you know, you would, they would perform operations and you would have uh, an audience sit all around. So on the left is the illustration, on the right is the final product and that's our surgical theater, the theater that we built um, on a stage. Uh, we had the lights custom made, um, found all the different items uh, through you know, eBay, uh, Etsy, antique shops. I mean, we really acquire all these items through very, you know, different venues here. Oops, sorry. Again, here's another um, illustration up in the, up the, that's the concept illustration up in the upper left-hand corner um, for our entryway into the NIC. And, uh, in the background, you see all the different plans that the art directors drew up, and I don't have a plan full, but, um, and then below is what we came up with. Again, that is another printed floor to represent tile. So it's printed on paper once again, and our, our set dressers lay it all down and have to match up the pattern and put it all down, and it looks beautiful. More of the nick. Again, concept illustration. I think we did a pretty good job making it look the way the director and the production designer wanted it to look like. Uh, this is our, these are our hospital wards uh, and our outdoor clinic. In the upper right hand corner is our pathology lab. In the lower right hand corner is our outdoor clinic, which we shot at a location. Um, on the left-hand side is our, we have a, man, a man's ward, a men's ward and a, and a women's ward. Uh, we looked at a lot of research from um, the psychiatric hospital, which I can't think of right now. Um, the old one. Mm -hmm. King, yeah. Pilgrim State, no. Um, no, it's here in New York. Bellevue. 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 Yeah, Bellevue. Uh, Bellevue Hospital, and the director fell in love with beds that I couldn't find anywhere, so we had to have those custom made, which is another part of our job. These are exterior scenes from the Nick. Um, these are really challenging to do, especially here in you know, modern day New York. So the uh, picture on the upper left-hand corner, if you getting confused, it looks so good. It, it looks like an illustration, but it's not. Uh, it's part of a shot that we did. And that was, I think, on West Street in Brooklyn, uh, Greenpoint. Uh, yeah, below it is the illustration. And then on the right over here is a school that we've been shooting at in Bed-Stuy. It's at a boys' school, a really old boys' school that we turned into our exterior Nick hospital. Um, we dirt the streets. We use lots of awnings to cover uh, old buildings. We make storefronts. We fill the storefronts with faux stores. Uh, it's challenging but fun. This is the ambulance um, carriage house that we built onto the boys school you can see up in the upper left hand corner um, again we're responsible for the lighting we're responsible for the glass that goes into the windows the hardware for the doors uh, all of the set dressing you see the the barrels the shovels the shades the dirt like I said before we use a lot of dirt on this show so it's not really glamorous work Uh, this is a scene that we, we did down the Lower East Side. This is the corner of Grand and Broom. Um, this was a really extensive street set that we did. We, it was, it's actually a four-way. Uh, we had about, I think, two weeks prep to get this street done. The dirt came in probably two days before we were going to shoot. Um, the one store, well, the, on the lower right-hand corner there is we, we made a bar into what was Ernest Sohn Jeans. So we had to empty out that whole jean store and we turned it into a bar, which I don't have an interior photo, but we brought in um, a bar, a back bar, uh, lighting, chairs, you know, glassware, bottles. Um, and the other thing we did here, like I said, to make it look, to bring it back in time, we covered a lot of the storefronts with awnings. Awnings do <coughs> wonders. Uh, the carpenters come in, they built storefronts, faux storefronts that, again, we filled. I must have had about 10 different 
storefronts that we had to fill. They were either sewing shops or like meat stores. We brought all, in all of these vendors. We filled them up with fruits and vegetables and you know fabrics. And the prop department also had a hand in bringing in vendors. Um, but this was a really challenging scene. And I don't know, again, if anyone watched the show, but the day after this, I mean, Instagram like blew up with all of our photos. People we were just taking the photos of the set. <laughs> how New York was transformed back in time. Mm -hmm. This was another street scene that we did that was supposed to be like the uh, Black Tenderloin District and we did this in Brooklyn. Um, again, the lower, uh, the lower left hand corner is a location before photo. Uh, up above it is our after photo. Oh, actually that's the concept <coughs> illustration scene. We did so well again that I'm getting confused. On the right hand side is what it actually turned out uh, to look like. Um, and again, I mean, we basically took over the whole street and did storefronts, again, awnings and signage, um, brought in vendors, lighting fixtures. I mean, everything you see, we're responsible for. These are some of our interiors. Uh, and it's really funny that Andrew showed two of my favorite films that inspired me all the time. Uh, one was Remains of the Day and the other is Age of Innocence. Um, and I always wanted to work on a Merchant Ivory film. I never got the chance, but working on this is you know, kind of almost like it. So it's heaven every day to go to work. Uh, this, the bottom pictures here, the, the um, lower right corner uh, and the upper left cor corner are filmed at a location up on, in Harlem. It's the old Barnum and Bailey home. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with it, but it was purchased a couple of years ago by a young couple and they've been trying to restore it over the years, but it's basically, there's holes in the ceiling, there's holes in the floor, uh, we came in, we put faux ceilings up, we wallpapered the ceilings, we, we put in wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, we brought in all of the light fixtures, all of the furniture. Um, I mean, the house has amazing bones, it has a beautiful detail, but you know, we basically brought the house to life. So much that when we left last year, the owners were just begging us to just leave everything. We <laughs> we're having Thanksgiving soon. We'll have a <laughs> but unfortunately, we couldn't do it. We're going back this season, so hopefully we can leave some things for them. Now comes George. You have to flip through the... I've got to click through it, right? Yeah. Oh. To get to the following. Uh, no. The well, other no. Point. Other way? Not buttons? Uh-oh. I'm going the wrong way, right? Maybe we, maybe we have a... The slides get mixed up. Should be this one. There we go. And I'll just... Yeah, okay. <laughs> this one may come. Okay, you want to you want to go to the front? Yeah, let's start right there. Okay, okay. that's good. Yeah, fun. Anyway, um, I also uh, work on uh, the Fox show, the following, the Kevin Bacon show. Um, that I've, we're in our third season now. Um, if anybody's familiar with it, it's uh, it's about serial killers. He's chasing down serial killers, and um, I just want to talk a little bit about. TV and, and it's uh, the process in terms of how it's a little bit different uh, than working on a film. Um, in TV, your time is very limited, um, episodic television. On our particular show, uh, we shoot an episode every eight days. Um, and every eighth day, we're doing what they call a tandem, which means you're doing two shows the same day, um, the last episode and the first episode. And so it means that, you know, you've got double the work. And probably in a typical uh, episode, you could do anywhere from um, a dozen settings, which is probably a conservative estimate, to 25 different sets. Um, if you've got stage sets, usually when you start out in the beginning, you're able to have the luxury to do something like that, which is lay out a board to show the director and the designer what you have in mind for one of the permanent sets. This particular set, Ryan's apartment, that's, that's Kevin Bacon's character. In season two, they decided to take him out of the one environment that he was in and put him in, a, in a, a different apartment because he had a different job and he moved on and he had money and all this other stuff. So anyway, so this is an example of a board that we put together to show what um, it could possibly look like. And then, um, you know, once I kind of showed it to our designer and it was approved and Whatever we moved on to make the various purchases and um, and put the set together, 
uh, was set obviously built uh, built on stage, so it, it had all the elements of a regular uh, apartment from the kitchen cabinets to the counters, uh, tile on the floor, working fixtures, um, counter uh, counters, and uh, it also had an exterior and, and, uh, a hallway where uh, various apartment doors so that you could you know show an, an entry into it, um, and these are all from that um, from that one set. Um, back to that one. Um, we use real tile, everything working, and and all the the uh, the shower and the um, sink are made practical so that if they have any kind of action or whatever, that's all the decorator's uh, responsibility. Um, but this is just like one example of 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 a stage set that is one of many. In a, a TV show, in, in the, the same time, you're also working on the location uh, settings, which um, those can be um, either very detailed or not much. Sometimes they'll walk into a location and, and shoot it as is. Other times, they'll ask you to make it into something else. Lots of times, what TV really has to do is they have to make their day. So um, sometimes, if they're doing multiple locations, you have to take an empty room in the same location, make it into something else, and um, you're constantly being asked to kind of, you know, do that kind of thing. And um, usually the designer for the first, you know, I don't know, four or five days of, of the episode is probably in a van scouting and telling you what's going on in the next episode while you're working on the current episode. So there's a lot of talking on the phone and, and discussing about what is needed, what you have to do, what he thinks is going to come up. And then you eventually go on a location scout where they show you what the settings are going to be for that next episode. And you probably have anywhere from a day and a half to six days to then prepare. So you kind of have to be very quick on your feet and, and quick with the way that you might want to approach decorating a set, whether it be a bedroom or uh, a house with five rooms or a hospital setting or whatever. But um, it all. It all is part of, of the process, and um, you know, with with adequate help and whatever, you're you're kind of you know have all those pots on the stove, and you're stirring every single one of them. So you're worrying about the current what, what's going on in the current episode, in addition to worrying about prepping for the next episode. So you could be probably worrying about you know half a dozen sets in one particular day, um, and that's kind of the world that episodic TV as opposed to a film where you've got a little bit more of the luxury of kind of planning out um, exactly what is what and, and, and putting those elements together with a little bit more time than, than on, a, on a TV show. And you just have to be quick on your feet. And that's, it's a, it can get very, uh, <laughs> get a little crazy, um, especially when they don't find a location or, you know, they've got a couple locations that don't work. Like yesterday, um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, but that's uh, that's kind of uh, the way that TV goes. So just to give you an idea of how it's a little bit different in the TV world as opposed to the feature world. Okay, so so I'm going to ask these guys to um, uh, uh, come up on the stage and. Um, and um, we're going to do a little uh, Q and A. Um, I, I don't know, John. How do you want to do it? Does, does people people just uh, raise their hands, and we'll call them out? Um, uh, I just wanted to um, uh, um, just uh, bring up one thing um, uh, when George was talking um, that uh, you guys could talk a little bit about your swing gangs and your lead men. Mm -hmm. Um, and how the uh, leapfrogging goes on with the sets. Right. Um, a lead man, the lead man is, is basically the, the person who runs our crews. Um, it's an important job because it's, it's somebody that you really rely on to kind of pull it all together for you. And they really have a lot of responsibilities from, you know, just organizing the, you know, picking up of the furniture to having enough manpower at the certain places where you need them, making sure that, you know, they booked enough uh, people. And, you know, it, it's, it, I, it, 
It's a job that I think really requires incredible organization and you know a crew who, um, who's got the ability to do technical things in, in addition to being able to move a piece of furniture. And um, you know, there's there's different people who have different skills. So you know that you know one guy on, on that crew might be great with fabric, and uh, and you know another girl might be you know good at, at you know all that intricate stuff. I usually like to say that you know um, I always like to have um, a woman who can kind of like do that because the guys sometimes don't want to be bothered with it. It's like they'll throw it over there, but you know you get somebody else who can really kind of make it the environment that you want to because all of those different little environments that you create, you want them to be real and you want them to feel that, that believable. You just don't want it to be stuff that's thrown on a desk or on a, on a dresser or whatever. You know, I'm Great. So questions? It depends on the size of the project. I think the minimal crew on a smaller or mid-sized job, and in set decorating, there's a set decorator, there's an assistant set decorator. Usually we have, sometimes we'll have a buyer, and then you have a lead person, and what we call the, the, the crew, there's four or five set dressers, and then we have additional man, additional days, which could be 50 to 1,000. It really depends on the size. Uh, in the art department, there's a production designer, uh, art director, well, and any one of you go through what it's so, in um, a Production designer, art director, assistant art directors, you, you, you um, use as many as you need, uh, depending on the project, or as many as they'll pay for. Um, a graphics per person, I mean, when you look at a show like Blacklist, there are two permanent uh, graphics uh, designers. Um, a show like Persons of a Person of Interest has three. Um, I I at the very least, there's one. Um, and uh, then there's art department coordinator, um, a, um, art department PA or multiple PAs, uh, a props master, and a shopper, and um, and that's sort of your core, uh, your core group, but. Um, but then there's a construction department, a paint department, a greens department, and, um, and all these sort of peripheral things. And we all work with uh, visual effects, stunts, um, and, uh, and organize everything with uh, the schedule with the uh, assistant directors and, uh, and working with the producers as well. Yeah, oh, sorry, yes? They are, they, their union is specific, so I'm gonna let them answer that. Yeah, I mean, I'll let George answer too. I mean, as far as, um, I mean, I started out doing non-union work. That's not how I got into the union. Uh, but nowadays, I think the way to try to go and get into the union or, or in our union, uh, it's a little harder than it was before. And a lot of people come up being um, PAs, like a production assistant in the set decorating department or in the art department so they can get experience. Uh, nowadays, I think George should finish, but they yeah. Have to, like, I mean, I think it, yeah. I, 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 it's it the way that it kind of has worked in the past um, has been that, like Regina says, that people come up in in the art, the PA world, and then they kind of uh, get a chance to um, experience what goes on in the department. Because lots of times, I don't think as somebody who's young comes in, they don't know exactly what area they want to go into so they're able to observe what everybody does and what you know people's you know responsibilities are and then they kind of go from there and i think that the way it has been happening is that those people will then um get an opportunity to um work what they call what they've called on permit which means that when it's busy the unions have a, a kind of like a, a list of people 
who they will send out on, on jobs to say, okay, well, you know what, everybody who has a, a union card in their pocket is employed, so we're able to send out, you know. And because of, of the nature of, of the way that New York has been in the last few years with an incredible influx of, of, of TV work, um, that it has been that a lot of people have been working on permit. I know on the show that I'm doing, I mean, you know, every day is a different um, uh, requirement in terms of how much manpower you need, because it depends on what you're doing. Um, but on certain days, you'll bring in, you know, maybe uh, additional from your core crew. Like, I think my core crew is about eight on my show. But sometimes we'll have 15 people. You know, sometimes I bet you six of those people are probably working on a permit, which means they don't have a union card in their pocket. So, um, you know, there is that, that that goes on. I don't know, um, you know, all the particulars, but uh, I think that the opportunities are there. I just don't know how, you know, it it's progressed. Um, but that's usually where people start, is that they get an idea, um, you know, in the art department or whatever, and, and they go from there. Um, I just add that production designers have a slightly different route. Um, we usually um, go to school for uh, production design, or you know, some people come up through the art department as PAs and then art department coordinators. Some decorators start designing. Some, um, but uh, um, but my students are all over there. <laughs> so um, there there are different ways to break in, but it's also a union, and there's a union exam as well and that uh, requires a completed project. And, um, and you can get in on that completed project, but then you have to work um, as a, an assistant art director usually, and, or PA assistant art director, um, or an illustrator assistant art director, and then production design. Next, yes? If you were, um, for television shows, interested in working in the art department, who is the hiring? Well, you um, you find out uh, you can find out actually through the New York Film Commission what's shooting, and uh, the best thing is to send out your resume to um, to a, a, you know a production office, or if you can find the um, art department coordinator for the department, that's actually a, a really good in that you know they usually keep resumes, or you know some I, I get resumes directly. I'm sure you guys do as well, you know, for people who are. Yeah, gen uh, generally, once you get your foot in the door and you get a job on, as a PA, you, you just continue to work. Yeah, because it becomes PA. word of mouth kind yeah. of. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's all word of mouth. It's, 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 it's oh. this network that, that goes on. Um, I, I just uh, want to bring up one more thing. There's, um, uh, because of the New York tax credit, um, the, there, in the last eight years or so, there's been this enormous influx of, of work here so that this has become an industry town. Um, it may change when Los Angeles gets their tax credit, which I believe may start in May. Um, but right now, there are about 35 television shows shooting here. And you can imagine with this number of people, um, it's, it is a big demand for, uh, for uh, hands. And um, there's also a difference between um, their, their features, then their pilots, and then their television shows. Um, pilots are the, um, the initial episode that's made um, by uh, a television company to test the show. If the pilot is uh, is picked up, if they order more shows, that becomes uh, the first episode. If, um, if the pilot isn't picked up, it's shelved, and you never see it again. So um, right now, we're in the, uh, the throes of pilot, pilot season, season, and it's next to impossible to get crew. Hmm. Um, so, Stuart? <laughs> Yes. Uh, 
there's never enough. I mean, I, 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 I've been done very tiny movies. I've done giant movies. And budget's always an issue. So, it, and it, it depends on what the set needs. I mean, a set could be, you know, I think the minim, minimal we would spend on a set is ten to $15,000, but then it can go on up to hundreds of thousands. I turn to the production designer. <laughs> exactly. That's that's why. That's the reason I'm not. A, I don't want to be a production designer. I, you know, as a set decorator, we don't have to deal with that much politics. We're we're doing the the dirty work, and um, and so that's I, I I look to the designer and I say, hey, this. But now usually a director is. And I, and I yeah. usually look behind me. But um, for the most part, the direct the director trusts the people he, he has hired and or she has hired and they're they're kind of out of our world and and I and I try very hard in my work to manage everybody's expectations so they're not walking on a set and seeing it for the first time and going surprise and they're like what are those big scissors doing there you know we, we try to show them what it's going to look like beforehand and and involve them in the process so it's not it's not a big shock. Well, one of the one of the good things about uh, current technology is that you can take a picture with your phone and send it. So, um, so if you know if if there are three sets that are shooting the you know the next day, um, you know, and and I can only be at one. Right. And um, then, then usually I'll get pictures, and I will show the director. And if there are problems, and there are, there can be, um, like where's the you know where's the statue of Venus um, that I asked for? Um, then, um, yeah. <laughs> and then I get the call. And all of a sudden, uh, David, we need that statue, and then we're scrambling all over, and we, somehow we find it or figure it out. <laughs> yes. Um, um, well, fun. Um, it's um, uh, my job is. Um, I, I sometimes I feel like the um, like the um, main water valve for for a city's water supply. <laughs> I, I feel as though um, um, after the initial conceptual ideas are. are are created, that my job is to filter out as much information as I can to every single person in the project as possible and keep the creative vision going. So, um, so sometimes I know things because I've been in a scout van with a director that the producer doesn't know and, um, and I have to make sure that that, that information is conveyed. But um, you know, when as a production des designer, um, if you don't know the director, to get the job, you have to pitch an idea, and um, and and a look for the film, and um, and one thing that we haven't talked about really is sort of color theory, and um, and each project really has a, a palette and and a range, or you can divide it up into sets, and sets will have different palettes and different ranges. And there are often times when you may excise one or two colors from a show. So you know, red may be reserved specifically for a main character, or it may be reserved for blood. There are some directors who don't like blue. Um, so there's blue in the show. And, um, and there, uh, there are some times when, um, you know, if you look at a film like um, like a, a Sixth Sense, um, red is specifically reserved for ghosts. So, um, you know, and the rest of the palette is gray and sort of mauve, and um, and there are exceptions to that rule, but but generally, um, uh, you you try and create a look. And sometimes it's with the cinematographer um, who's creating a cinematic look, you know, and using filters or something like that. And and now the other thing that I actually wanted um, you guys to actually talk about a little bit is with digital photography, um, our lives have changed somewhat, um, especially with lighting um, and lighting a set. When once we went from film to digital, um, our work 
can actually do the work for the cinematographer. And so lighting becomes an enormous, an enormous part of a set. Do you guys have any? Yeah, well, I mean, we often, are, yeah, we are providing a lot of the fixtures, the fix, practical fixtures we are providing will end up lighting a set. So, you know, the, the, the character's at a desk, you know, it's very, the desk lamp is, will, could become the key source for him. Um, I do, you know, with digital, another thing that has happened, especially with high definition, it's not as forgiving. I mean, we used to be able to fake a lot of things. We can't really get away. Now we see everything. Everything is so crisp, and everybody has, you know, 50-inch TVs, and it's, it's hard to, you know, we, yeah, it's, un, it's not forgiving. Um, Sorry, yes? Well, it depends um, it, it, uh, on a movie. Um, it, it, if they feel as though they are going to do reshoots, um, then a set can be stored. It, it's frozen. And, it, it, yeah, it's um, usually, I mean, usually they hold the key sets until they get um, a release, you know, after the first cut or whatever. I mean, yeah, it's called picture, when the picture's locked is the yeah. term. And, and yeah, I mean, the movie I did, True Story, uh, we, built, we built several sets we built a prison a big prison uh, visitors room and five months later after we finished principal photography they decided to do reshoots and we had to reconstruct the set so the sets were all stored we pulled them out of storage reassembled them redressed them uh, and did the reshoots um, so uh, when they're not stored uh, they're you know we tr we try to recycle things are recycled that we don't a lot of materials get donated to various organizations that'll repurpose them or recycle sets. And on TV, we, you, the, they, all the scenery, a lot of the scenery is saved and they yeah. rebuild it. Because they so reuse the flats and, and that kind yeah. of thing. So. And also, you know, if, if, if you know you're picked up for next, you know, the following season, then, then they'll either, you know, leave the set standing or, um, or fold it and, and store it and then put it back together. But reshoots can be as simple as, you know, um, an insert of a hand on a desk writing a note, and you need the desk, or it can be a corner of a room, or it can be a full set. And we actually had new sets on, on uh, for True Story. They, they created a, a new visitation <laughs> room, which uh, oddly we really, the production designer was really pushing to do in the principal photography, and the studio wouldn't approve the budget, and then at the end they realized they needed it, so they had to go back and, and build it anyway. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, you, you heard it? guessing I mean you're yeah. it's and, and then, you know they want this number and sometimes you're you know you're locked into a number um, that you're stuck with for the rest of the show and then you find out okay then you see the location it turns out to be much bigger than what anyone anticipated and you know the chain of command basically for me is I have to go talk to the production designer and say you know this is this, this is how much we budget in the beginning and if we can't do what we have to do with the monies that I have. I mean, you have to then go to the production manager, the UPM, who basically gives you the okay or the, or the not 
okay to spend the money or yeah I think a lot, of, a lot of things figure in I think part of the problem with budgets in terms of uh, especially on a, on a film is that you know somebody long before we got on the film came up with a number and they put it on a piece of paper and they said this movie can be done for this amount of money and then you know when the film eventually gets made and, and the people who are in charge of actually doing that are presented with a number often I'd, I'll say to a, um, a production manager are you gonna give me the number or am I gonna back into the number or do you want me to give you the real number because you know often there's a big difference between what you really think you're going to spend and what they have in mind. So, you know, budgets can kind of be, um, you know, very, there's a, there's a lot of leeway in terms of, you know, are you building, are you going into location, is it existing, is it not, and what you're doing in that space. And, um, but often I kind of find that they have an idea in their head what they think it should be, but I don't think any of it's based on reality other than somebody put it on paper a long time ago. Yeah. But they also don't want to give you... Right, yeah. mm -hmm. and they say, "Well, do it for less," mm -hmm. and right. then we say, "You, you can't." It's always no matter what. They always say, "Do it for less." I've <laughs> never been told. Oh, we, oh, we, we actually that's less than we thought it was going to yeah. be. And like George said, there's it's, someone. I, I don't know who budgets these movies, but so it's obviously it's, not a set decorator. It's never a set decorator. Designer. It's someone sitting behind a desk. It's somebody who wants to get the you know the project made. So therefore, probably yeah. most part, and most times, it's lowballed. Number. Yeah. Yes. God. <laughs> I mean, we, we, patience. <laughs> patience. Uh, being able to, you know, I mean, things change. They're so fluid. I mean, you have to be prepared for, for you know, a truck breaks down and, and half your set dressing doesn't show up and it's not going to show up and you have to have the set ready in, in, in an hour. And you, have to be, you have to be able to think on your feet and really be able to be fluid and not let that stress you out. You have to be able to, okay, I'll come up with a plan B. You always have a plan B. Um, I, I, would, of humor. I would say that for you know for a decorator, um, one, one of the most important things is is to maintain a creative vision at the same time as being practical about how something can be accomplished um, in the time that's given and um, and with the resources at hand mm. um, and be. Um, and, you know, I mean, there are a lot of different personalities in this business. There's, you know, it's not a cookie cutter kind of thing. And there are some, you know, there are some people that, that you know, that some groups that just click and some that, you know, have friction. And it, 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 isn't, uh, it isn't a set thing. Yes. How much of what you do is actual artistic aesthetic versus It all depends on the project, and and I I mean I don't think we're hired for a signature look. At least as, as, as a decorator, we have to create so many looks. So, uh, but you know, some some movies are, are fantasy based, and some are are really. I mean, one of my first early jobs, I was an assistant decorator, the assistant decorator on JFK, and Oliver Stone. We we were creating a library um, in one of the characters' houses, and the movie you know took place I think 1963. Or no, no book could be dated past 1963, so, and there was 10,000 volumes in the book in the library. So I had to go through every one of those, you know, books and look for the dates to make sure that the camera didn't pick up. Some some movies are like that. Some movies, True Story was the movie I did. True Story, the the the, the True Story actually took place in the 90s. The designer decided, you know, I don't want to see big ugly cell phones. I don't want. I don't like the technology of the 90s. We're going to ignore that. It's just going to be contemporary. So it, 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 it varies, the amount of realism.
faster. But working in the city, I mean, I think we have a lot of resources and places that we go to other than pop houses. There are, you know, uh, little, there's thrift shops, there's antique stores, um, antique malls that are, you know, in the tri-state area that are really good. So Yeah, there's a lot of those places. Yeah, we go. There's always places. Right? We kind of try and stay away from, I mean, I think that you, you know, you kind of get to know that that might be a problem, that, you know, going that route. If you really, if, if time is of the essence, I kind of stay away from it because it's like, you know what, if I need that piece by a certain time or whatever, yeah. I'm not going to take the chance because we've all been burned, <laughs> you know. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's part of the game. And, and shopping is, a, is a, a large part of what we do. I mean, sourcing materials, once, once we figure out what those materials need to be, binding them is, is a big part of all the way in the back. Our process. Part, that is the fun part. I was going to actually ask how one becomes a shopper. Um, well, it's a union position. Um, we call it an assistant decorator or a buyer. There's actually a position called a buyer. Um, so it's the same process, I think, you know, becoming a PA uh, in an art department or, or there, we do have set, set decorating PAs um, and going through that. Yeah. That, different uh, people yeah, take different routes. I mean, I worked in a, like I said, a pop house. Um, I started out as a set dresser working for uh, George's brother and other people. So I, I was a hands-on person and dress sets and, and then eventually became a, a shop girl who would run the shop for the lead man and then uh, a shopper and then an assistant. I also assisted these two guys. And then I mean, you just kind of work your way up like in any other field, I think. I think we just have time for one more question. Okay. Ah. <laughs> So once a set is done, what happens to everything? Like what happens to that custom sectional or at the conference table or where the giant scissors now? I don't know where the giant scissors are now. <laughs> Fortunately, they're not in my house. They, they, were, um, they went on sale for eBay with yeah. Twilight. I bid on So it, it, it varies. Sometimes there's a big sale at the end of a job, which is great if you ever can go to one. Um, a lot of times the stuff just goes into storage waiting for the picture to be locked, and then it'll go to an auction, or it'll go on sale, or it'll go back, they'll ship it back to, they'll sell it to a prop house, sometimes it goes back to the studios in Los Angeles. It, um, I don't know, every, every job, it just, it's a problem at the end, how do we get rid of all yeah. this material? There's, I, 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 I can just bring up, there's, um, there's always a producer who wants something. Well, yes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and they have to struggle with me, um, because I usually want the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can is is that is that it? One one more pop. Oh, sorry. Which? Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Well, I have a tough question. Mine's the mask one. So, is it harder to work in someone's real residence versus a stage, or do you prefer working in a real residence? I've never worked in a real residence, so I I I I don't know. I would think. I just can't imagine dealing with a per uh, personality, but I, I don't know. You mean working in a location as versus? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant like a person, a private person. No, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you meant like working for as an interior as an designer. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I mean I working in a location. Yeah. It's yeah. much harder working. Much harder. Much harder, much harder yeah. working in a real location. However, the cost is much less. So, uh, so a producer, if a producer can put something into a location, they will, mm -hmm. as opposed to build a set, because. You know, you're um, just to take a very simple example, but you know, like an attic in in uh, on a location might be you know a fifteen thousand dollar fee, um, and to build it would be fifty to sixty thousand dollars. So just the shell. And it's hard because we we have to get absolutely every single thing in a built set. So from the lights, you know, everything. So. I say thank you to you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all.